Thank you, everyone. I'm Suzanne Templin with Houseman Johnson Insurance. Thanks for joining our webinar today on returning the injured employee to work. Timer will be presenting today. Before we get started, I just want to give you a few reminders. Today's webinar will run about 45 minutes, and we'll have a Q&A uh, session after the presentation. After the Q&A, there will be a short survey, and we're hoping you can fill it out for us. It will pop up in the WebEx application at the end of the presentation. After the survey is over, we'll display the SHRM and HRCI credit information for those who are interested. Um, you can also type in a, a question in the Q&A feature at any time throughout the webinar, and we'll address it. Thank you for joining us today, and PEG will begin shortly. Everyone, I hope you're all doing well, and thank you for participating in this webinar. I'm hoping that you're able to at least take one positive I'm away from this there. And um, I also hope that you take advantage of our services. Please feel free to call me after uh, the, uh, the uh, webinar. And if you have any questions, I'm always available to uh, walk scenarios or concerns or issues that you have with your workshop program. So we'll begin. I will discuss, discuss how a proactive transitional return to work program will help you the employer. A, say TTW, which represents transitional return to work. There are a lot of um, acronyms in the work comp business, so hopefully I will spell it out for you. The of the of today is to provide different topics, how this will help increase production costs, the comp program, and maintain employee morale, and hire solid new employees. With transitional return to work, or TRTW, this is actually returning your injured employee to work with the temporary work restrictions given by the treating physician. It's nothing to be injured at work. It, it really isn't. So who loses when this occurs? Of course, the employee, you the injured, your current staff, your customers, business, the employee visits, and the family. Where do we start? Who can And it's you. I say that two heads are better than one. And I think to make this work, it shouldn't always rest on the insured. So they're offering this program today to let there are others out there that are available with expertise. It does start with you, the client. And for a TRTW program to be successful, we have the owner's buy-in. It's crucial. You have the buy-in from the people that are at the top and make decisions. So that's the most important thing. So what the owner the CEO, the COO, accounting, human resources, or safety directors. In Wisconsin, we have three people currently on our claims staff, two specialized in workers' compensation. Uh, I myself have over 20 years' experience as does my manager, Susan Dorsch. And we come from the insurance carrier side of business. Our agents are eligible as well, and we have a safety manager here as well. The third part of the Trinity, which is the insurance carrier, and we represent many, many different carriers here from all over the country. The guild writers, loss control staff, and claim staff. And that is usually who I partner with is the claim staff in coming to a good resolution for your outstanding claims. So a good nation yields a successful outcome. Now, insured, whether you're three people, 30 people, or 300 people, you may not have an employee handbook but you see have a first day with the new hire or new employee and our initial training period. So what we like to see, and I think what is, what is most important and crucial, is that when a new employee comes to site, you have your indoctrination period where they're trained on machinery, trained on procedures, um, hours, rate pay, um, HR procedures. But I think you as the insured 
it is important to let them know that you have a return to work program in place so that you set the culture and the tone with these people. And it should include in writing, and perhaps they sign as well, and a discussion, something on these lines. You know, you, John Jones, you're a new employer. We value you as a person and as an employee. In the event you are injured, we will work with you and your training practitioner and your supervisor to get back to your regular job or to a temporary modified job until you're able to return to work to your pre-injury job. So that sets the stage for your expectations and that you are willing to work with a physician to get these people back to work. Maybe let your new and current employees know what your return to work policy is so that there's no miscommunication and everyone is on, you know, this level. I think it starts with hiring practices and worked at an insurance company and I was a manager for 20 years and had, you know, over 30 people come go under my uh, tutelage, but they said, Hire smart. Hire hard. So I think a lot of time should be spent on thinking about resources that you do use. Do you have a labor attorney? Do you have a resource director or assistant? Do you have a staffing agency? Hire word of mouth? Do you have employees with relatives? Those are very good sources. That's just a place to begin. So we need to hear wisely. When you hire someone, I think the most simple question is, will you be able to fire them? Uh, it's hard when you hire employees, relatives, or someone you went to school with or someone you know. It doesn't work. It could be a very, very, um, never a very negative experience. And so I think when you hire someone, you have to ask yourself, will you be able to fire them? I point that a lot of our clients aren't aware of if um, they want it's not working out, the workers' compensation claim, when we do get the question asked a lot, can we terminate a person's employee while they have an active workers' compensation claim? Do not want to do that. And if you have questions in that particular, please contact me afterwards and we can we can go through that together. But, yeah, I have the question on here. Do you know how to fire someone during a work, work comp claim? You don't. Um, you can risk extra to other um, penalties that are not covered under your comp policy, and that could be a whole other uh, telephonic conference in itself. So what are your people? It's, but do you do a pre-employment physical? Do you have your name on CTAP, which is the Wisconsin Court Access System, which is free? Do you have formal procedures in place on hiring people? Do you have a written job description? And when I say written job description, uh, it have to be fancy, but it should entail what that person physically has to do day in and day out, including thinking, walking, stretching, bending, climbing. What does their job entail? In other words, could you take this to a doctor uh, to explain to them what this person does physically? We have people here at Husband Johnson that certainly can assist you with the project with our HR consulting services. Another thing I wanted to briefly talk about, and I don't have this written down, but even um, of experience, even the most sophisticated of our shirts, away from firing an employee, um, and I'm talking about workers' compensation, I'm talking about just letting someone go who's not doing their job. Time and again, what I have seen with our courts in Wisconsin, if you have disciplinary procedures, you need to use them. You need documents. If you have safety procedures and they don't follow them, you need to discipline that person and create a history so that it shows their behavior. This would be very if you would get into the uh, bill setting where you're involved in an application for hearing and have to go in front of administrative law judge to present and tell why this person was terminated. One of the most common things I have heard over the years is when, some, when someone has an injured employee, our, our clients say, I'm just going to fire that person. Well, um, 
that is something that should have been done before. And it's a hard thing to say, but that's why you have procedures in place. It goes to show your employee's character. It goes to show their work history. So if you have rules, use them. Another um, good way to help yourself as an employer, every community has a clinic or a chiropractor. Now, Wisconsin, injured workers can go to a medical doctor. They can go to a podiatrist. They can go to a chiropractor. They can go to a psychiatrist all those are, or even an osteopath. All those recognized forms of medical treatment in the state. One item that I don't see done very often is that are you the employer aligned with a local medical facility that would be willing to visit your workplace to see what you do? Um, you don't want the treating practitioner to take the word of an injured employee that, oh, I work at Kramer Company and they wouldn't have any light duty. Um, you really should hear it from you and not from the injured employee. If if they're not aware of what you do, um, that written job description can be sent along to the clinic when employees have an appointment. Um, the, the, these people should know what is required of your employees to do. If going to be proactive to get injured employees back to work, would you invite that person, that old practitioner in and give them a tour of what you do? Uh, are aware of the modified things that you would have your employees do, what they originally in their pre-injury status? The written descriptions are most helpful when your employees are injured. You can treat to the treating doctor to review before and after their initial, uh, initial appointment. And um, I think that would really pay off in the long run because then the, the, the facility gets to know who you are, what you're is, that you care for your employees, and it's not um, a misnomer or, or the big mystery to them. So it does pay off to him one, tour your facility, to know who you are and what you do. I'm um, great on the workforce, and I can say that personally on myself, um, but people are living longer, and they're working longer, so I will be prepared for the graying of the workforce. People are longer due to health insurance, need not saving enough for retirement, or children and grandchildren moving home. You hear more often than not. Do you offer discounts to local fitness centers? Uh, keeping these people in shape and, and so able to do their job without sustaining an injury. Do you have morning on-site stretching? Are incentives offered in the health insurance program that you are partnered with for good behaviors? One is to give gift cards to organic or health food stores for smart food choices. But we really can't deny people are working longer. They're working into their 70s at this point for financial reasons. Your reasons aren't as quick. Maybe your body isn't uh, atoned or ha have the same muscle tone that you had when you were 25 years old. So you need to be aware of that and be cognizant of that as, as employers. Let's talk about temporary modified duties, and this is really what the heart of the matter. Um, Again, whether you have five employees, 15 employees, 150, uh, nine times out of ten, when your employees sustain some type of back, neck, or shoulder strain, they can release them to work, but they most likely will have work restrictions. So in order to keep a claim medical only without paying indemnity benefits, do you a list or, or some type of work or can create some work, um, for three and modified job duties for injured employee to do while they heal after an injury. So to know that people need to get back to the workplace as soon as possible after an injury, if allowed by the doctor. Now, I'm not talking about traumatic injuries, but certainly sprains and strains, you need to keep going and moving for your body to heal. So a doctor is likely to give a temporary type of work restriction on lifting bending, reaching, a certain period of time, and are prepared for this. Now, a good, a good practitioner will be following up with your injured employee probably on a weekly or bi-weekly basis after the injury. Their on-work restrictions, they slowly be decreasing. If you've gone for two months and they're, staying, they're still on the same work restrictions, 
then something is definitely wrong. You or the claim rep uh, or worker, all three need to be talking to that physician. There needs to be some type of improvement that is monitored and showed. Now, when we talk about modified or temporary modified duties, we want to make this work um, meaningful and it needs to be medically matched to the work restrictions given by the doctor. If sedentary work, can they sit at the table and sort parts? Can they shred documents? Can they answer phones? I hear employers that say, well, so and so is incapable of doing office work or um, computer work. And I understand that. Um, we all have our, our fortes in what we do, but there should be some type of at least one or two universal jobs that someone would be able to do on a temporary basis. You don't need this into a long-term job. It has to be temporary. Um, another thing that is really hard for people, and I, I don't understand this, but um, talking to a physician, um, and that goes to your personal as well. Are you able to talk to your physician when you go to the doctor? Are you able to look them in the eye and talk to them? I know many people aren't, and that's really, really silly because these are just really good people that went to school longer than you or I. They're trained to do this. And if you don't tell them, they won't know. So it's, it's most important to educate them. And they're always looking to partner with the injured worker's employee. Employer. They don't always know what to do with these people, especially in small towns. They don't want to upset people because uh, they're afraid that that injured person will go back and talk to their parents, their siblings, their nieces and nephews. A small town doctor doesn't want to make their patients upset because could take from this business. So you as the employer have to be very, very brave. Um, you need to do this for yourself. You need to do this for the injured employee. Um, most physicians, nine times out of ten, will come to the phone and be receptive to your phone call or talk to their nurse. Somehow sit down in writing that you call that medical facility, talk to them, and make that clinic aware of temporary jobs that are available for injured people to do. An example would just be, hi, I'm Jack Jones. I'm calling from the Kramer Corporation. I understand you're treating John Doe for his leg strain. We really need him back to work, and he's a great employee. I understand, you know, I'm looking at some job reasons that you gave to him. We have a couple of jobs that would match that. Uh, can I talk to you about that, please? Once we're trying to save dollars, and by keeping them at work and having to pay indemnity, you can you will still have a medical only claim, but you get a 70% discount on that. And once again, it's good for the employer to get back to the excuse me, the employee to get back to their routine, get back to coworkers, and where you know the routine is important. So I think you have people that would normally be walking around at their house doing things at home, they certainly can be back to work. But once again, that needs uh, to be read either through your claim rep or through someone at your business. Return slips. Um, every time your injured employees go to the physician or chiropractor, podiatrist, whomever, it is their duty uh, to bring in their work status slips after medical appointments. Each time see that treating practitioner, they would make them bring the work slip, unless they're severely injured, of course, back in the office and to the person who is directed to be taking this correspondence. That is their exact duty. You, um, and you must, and a lot of times you will have to remind them to do so. But that isn't anything that these facilities haven't seen. It makes you say, you know, this, this is work comp. I need, um, you know, my employee needs to bring some information back to me or make sure that your employer aware that they are responsible for bringing back in the work status slips to you so you know are they able to work, are they back at full duty, or have they been given some work restrictions. Have someone prepared in your office or your business that is responsible for receiving that paperwork, spending time with them, thanking for bringing them in in a cordial and non-judgmental way. So let's talk about who has that uh, uh, this right now at your business. I don't know if you're here, 
people handle it, if you have a nurse on site, if this is sold by a uh, corporate charity. A lot of times people have multiple duties in this. Uh, a lot of times our insurance will have a return to work coordinator or someone, maybe even your safety manager. So think about this at the present time. Who currently handles this process now when you have people that are injured, they went to the doctor and they're coming back, who gets this information? Who, where, where did they dispense it after that time? Who needs to know this information? So we currently have a designated person who coordinates the return to work with outside and inside resources. Is it smoothly? Are you having any problems? Uh, how is it working out with your insurance adjuster? Are you getting what you need out of your insurance carrier's staff? Are they asking the right questions? Are they contacting you timely? Are they contacting your injured employee timely? Think about are you getting what you need? Here at AI, we certainly can assist you with work productively with your claims adjuster for a successful outcome. Susan, my manager, and I have a combined in many years' experience. This is what we did. This is what our staff did for many, many years. So we can tell you what to expect and how to obtain this information smoothly and successfully. Another probably a tip I would suggest is you, the employer, have a very simple packet ready to go made up in the office or with church work coordinator. A uh, packet that would include you, the employer, do like duty work available. Um, the first report of injury that you will fill out, and I know some of you insurance carriers where you fill out that first report of injury online um, would be a smart thing to have the employee down when available, any witnesses and supervisors exactly happened as soon as possible after the incident because we all forget. And, and what happened yesterday you may not recall perfectly today. So it, that doesn't have to be fancy. It can be on a plain piece of paper. What happened to you? Uh, your your course, what did they see? What did they not see? And that may be important in a case that's going to be disputed. If your injured employee said, well, Jackie and Shelly and Joe all saw injured, did they really do that? Did it happen? So some negative statements are important as positive statements. Certainly the supervisor that on at the time of the incident should be writing down what happened, and this should all go in a file together. Another um, process that I have been discussing with clients is when the employee has been released back to work, that you have a post-accident interview with them. Once again, very non-judgmental way. You know, we're very glad to see you back late from work. Can we just take a few minutes to go over procedures? Um, a lot of people don't know the proper procedure on lifting, bending, reaching, have taught that. That taught my son on your staff. It's always to acknowledge when your employees do a great thing, but if they're doing some type of process that leads to injury and they haven't been properly trained, then shame on us. So it, I think, would behoove you to take a few minutes and talk with your people when they're back to work, welcome them, and then just kind of briefly go over the accident. What could we do different? Is this something that you could do different? Is it something they could do different? So, wondering, well, why should we do all this? It sounds a lot. This insurance lady, she's talking about so many different things. It's confusing. It sounds convoluted. I throw all it in with your employees, but it also has to do with dollars and cents. Workers' compensation premium is very expensive, and it comes off your top line. But I know you as clients pay good, good money to the cares, and um, you should get the best bang for your buck. The form return to work program benefits um, in ways, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit. It helps reduce overall operational costs. If one of the key employees or any of your employees are injured, what's it take to replace that employee until they're able to return to work? Is it going to take more staff? Is it going to take more hours for other people to spread and more additional hours to cover that person's absence? 
the operational cost it takes when someone is getting away from mine or, or a route salesman or a driver. That, that is, I, I think we're all doing more with less, and certainly at, at this time, I don't see employers that have a lot of extra employees or fluff. Another um, good thing is that it improves communication. There's less fear about returning to, to work or talking with a treating practitioner. You're talking with your injured employee. I, I know you've been hurt, but we really, you know, we're looking forward to having you come back. It's, uh, we want you to get the best medical care so that there always is an open door uh, about the, but also talking about coming back. And we do hear a lot that. We have not heard from my employer. I don't think he cares about me. I've been injured. I've been home. I've been laid up, and no one has called me. So communication can go a long way. Quicker thing, I think uh, when people, um, when they're given a little TLC, whether it's legitimate or not, you, it's a positive outlook for injured employees, and they certainly will go back and tell a good positive tale about how you treat them to other employees. You know people talk, uh, water cooler discussions, but people really are, are, you know, people talk, people talk, and a positive result does a lot of good uh, for you as a business than uh, a situation that has not been taken care of successfully. If you have additional work, it provides a meaningful way for the injured employees to come back to work earlier uh, than initially planned. If it's meal, they will they'll be glad to be back. Sometimes people don't like the transitional work and then magically they are healed and able to go back to their regular jobs. So how that works, it's a positive thing, but you are at least getting them back to work uh, to business. Also a lot of uh, we get a lot of questions about, you know, Gosh, Joe Jones injured himself, and he's got a back, bad back. He's been off for a while. I hate to bring him back because you know he's going to hurt his back again. Am I liable for that? Well, yes, you certainly are. Um, so I think by using transitional temporary type work, it reduces the risk of injury by matching jobs to injured workers' abilities. So you're responsible for them, whether it's a new accident or a continuation of the initial claim. But it, this way... You get a doctor's approval by offering temporary work that uh, would lead to less re-entry. Also, all keeps your operations in process. At least you have that person back to work. Hopefully, you have something meaningful for them to do so that your work can, continu can continue and the loss is mitigated. There talks about um, the difference between a long-time claim and a medical-only claim. Now, in Wisconsin, there is a waiting period of three days before indemnity benefits have to kick in. Every state in the union has a waiting period. So um, you with the employer are not liable for that for any of that injured worker during that three period. If you return your injured employee to regular temporary modified duties within three days, no indemnity benefits are due. And so looking at let's say you um, Joe injured. He has fifteen dollars, fifteen dollars of medical bills. You don't have a return to work program, or you do. It's still a fifteen hundred claim. Say that uh, he was off several days, or two weeks, three weeks, whatever. He sustained lost time that the insurance carrier, on your behalf, paid out at three thousand five hundred dollars. So a return to work program, a check is sent. If you do have a return to work program that you have jobs they can do at regular hours and you pay them their regular pay, it's it's just a temporary or different job. Be zero payment. So the total claim with no return to work program would be five hundred dollars. If the return to work program it's fifteen hundred dollars. However, the Wisconsin Compensation Rating Bureau gives you a seventy percent discount on all your medical claims. So that with the return to work program is only four hundred fifty dollars versus five thousand dollars. That's something to think about. Show that if you have a total return to work program, the return investment is nine dollars saved for every dollar spent in the return to work program. A medical improvement that is rendered by the treating practitioner and 
um, that is the only person that can give end of healing. Uh, still can have people back to work while they're still medically treating. And once we talked about it before, sometimes there's just physicians are stumped on what to do with injured workers. They have to listen to them. They've taken a Hippocratic oath, and they have to write down what they say, even if they don't believe them. But they are at a loss sometimes as to what to do with people that are injured. They would probably welcome a call from you to that person back to work or that you offer transitional work. So think about that. They aren't always the bad person, but you run a show in the state of Wisconsin. But we looked at different medical reports and looked at claims over a period of time with other clients such as yourself that have return to work programs, and we saw that without a return to work program, most doctors uh, gave medical the healing or maximum medical improvement or discharge in 13 weeks. With companies that had a return to work program, we saw a medical a maximum medical improvement given at five weeks, so it's a six percent reduction in indemnity benefits. Eight of claims occur within the first six months higher, and 26% of the claims occur within the first year of higher. So is that a bit higher? Is it poor training? We don't really know, but just is that you're likely to have a claim made by a new employee than by a seasoned employee. How can we help you? Um, we have a lot of good, smart people here. I'm not talking particularly about myself. We have agents that are well-versed. We have um, Rich Johnson, who's our safety manager. There's three of us in claims. We, we certainly can help you uh, and, and tips to improve our workers' compensation programs, talk about return to work programs. We break it down into four or six easy steps. We usually work with the carriers, or we can in, implement this ourselves. But it isn't anything that's hard. It's, it's all things that you have in place right now. And I think the, mo the, the, the biggest having an open mind as an employer to and to get by and keep people to pre and train and implement a return to work program. We're able to do on site training, talking with your owners, uh, advisors, employees, and to educate them as well. Remember, knowledge is power. And I hope once again that you've been able to take at least one good item away from this program. If not, I haven't done my job. But please know I'm available by email or phone call, and it's a free service. You're welcome to call as often as you'd like. So are we able to take questions? Yes. Yeah. Does anybody have questions? from anyone at all. A question for you. Uh, we currently have an employee who has um, been brought back to work on light duty. Um, do you have, you know, written restrictions from his doctor, which are pretty vague. Um, is it okay, you know, if we have something in particular that we want him to do that may not be addressed in those written restrictions, are we able to ask him, like, are you comfortable doing this? Or can we really leave it up to the employee to decide if they're comfortable or feel safe doing something? Well, that's a question. Um, what I would do in that case is because the, uh, the physician is driving the boat, I would uh, have something written up very briefly and pass it over or walk it over or send it over to the physician and say, would you okay uh, this to Joe Jones to do you know, for the amount of time? You really need to get uh, the physician approval. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. And I have one other question for you. Um, if we, when we've worked with um, claims in the past, we've always had our adjuster that we've worked with who has always kept in contact with our employees. Um, yeah. I know how you how you had mentioned that you know some employees feel like, well, my company doesn't care; they don't contact me. Um, I guess my fear is kind of in contact with the adjuster too of me maybe contradicting something the adjusters told them. 
I mean, is, is should the employer also be contacting the employee, or do I just trust that you know the adjuster keeping in contact with me and the employee is, is acceptable? Sure. Well, that's another great question. Um, if a great adjuster, that's awesome. Uh, I spent over 30 years in the insurance carrier side, and unfortunately, and 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 we represent some of the best carriers. But if you have a claim rep that has 150 cases, they may, may not be all, always able to contact the injured employees timely. And most of them do do a good job. Um, when I when I supervised, I always had my staff after every medical appointment contact that injured worker for updated information. You know, coaching. Did you bring your slip into the employer, et cetera, et cetera, so that we knew there was this constant progression after medical treatment. But yeah, you want to have this injured person have everybody calling him, and that isn't good either. But I think uh, as the employer you need to be making some type of contact with them to see. You know, I I talked to your jester today. She said you're doing really really well, and I would make sure that. You do that as often as you think prudent, but just a quick call to say, hey, are, are you getting everything you need from the adjuster? Are your checks getting there timely? Just a check in so that they know you're involved as well because we hear that more often than not. Well, I'm only hearing from the adjuster. I'm not hearing from I'm not hearing from my boss or from my supervisor or anybody. So a call once in a while wouldn't hurt. I think it goes to goodwill and, uh, and good communication. Okay, thank you. Back-to-work policy. Can an employee who works construction work in the office as a light duty? Meaning they are not actually hired to do office work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, if that person has transferable skills and they're on the sedentary work, as long as the doctor, as long as you provide something within the restrictions given by the doctor, anything is fair game. Now, remember, you don't always have to pay um, the full wages, if he's earning like $40 an hour but comes and does clerical work that may be $15 an hour, it's up to you to continue his regular wages or he receives temp partial, which is a payment from you and a payment from the insurance carrier. The ultimate goal is to keep um, keep your injured employees at full hours and full wages to avoid an indemnity claim. But certainly anything is fair game as long as it's meaningful, not derogatory, and, and certainly if you need to help the office, Office, that's great. I, I think that's a good way to bring someone back to work. Do you sending light be uh, descriptions every time there's a claim? Not necessarily. Um, I think it depends on the person. You know your people, and um, not every employee is stellar. And if you, uh, I think this is one thing I've always said over the years. If you have trouble with an employee before claim, don't think it's going to be any easier with them during the claim. So you have uh, some that you're just not sure you think it's going to take advantage of the situation. That's where I would send a job description of light duty work. Uh, if it's going to be a long term thing, uh, a long term, like talking six to eight weeks, um, it depends what the injury is and depending on what you do. You certainly. Um, um, you know, it's a matter of keeping a wound site clean. You certainly wouldn't send them back to work in the sewer plant or something like that. It depends on the situation, depends on your employee, and uh, and that you have to be the best judge of. And talk with your adjuster or give us a call here. And by certainly, no me, you have some great adjusters out there, and they know what they're doing, and they work hard. Sometimes they just have to do too many things. So we're all here to answer questions as well, but... Um, your doctor doesn't know what you do. The doctors and, and nurses are trained very differently than than a lot of what your business is. So, I think I think keeping someone in, um, informed is better than not. Does that? Yeah. Okay. Some, some follow up on the previous question. Um, Judy's sharing. Uh, we just recently had an insured, or I'm sorry, insured employee do volunteer work. We only. Um, had to pay minimum wage for this person, and the insurance company picked up the rest of his wages. 
uh, when contacting a physician, what questions can be asked? Judy, if you're like, uh, as you, the employer, when you call the doctor, remember there are, there are HIPAA laws in the state, but when someone is injured at work comp, they, they give up those rights. So uh, now, my husband Johnson cannot speak to the physician, but certainly you as the employer can because this is where the incident occurred. You're paying the bill. So you certainly, um, you know, you can't ask about prior injuries, but you can discuss the injury at hand and what you have available there. Um, you have many people that if you can't return um, their employees to work, we will, the insurance carriers will seek a nonprofit situation and, um, and the insurance carrier, or between the insurance carrier and uh, you, the employer, the wages will be paid. So those work out as well. But yeah, you, can, you can ask the physician mostly anything up only up that, that claim. Anyone? These are questions. One questions. I believe my information is here. The second slide. And um, I'm at 0825296604. I'd love to hear from you at any time and uh, discuss the notes, questions you have. And um, that's what I do for Husband Johnson. So please take advantage of those services. Let's open the poll now and um, for about two minutes. And then after that, I'll pull up the uh, the SHRM and HRCI um, credit slides so that you can just take a minute to jot down those codes. 